Hello, and welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we are continuing our discussion on the poetry collection Thrown in the Throat by Benjamin Garcia. Today, we will be discussing some of our favorite pieces and lines in the second half of the collection. Very good. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you for sticking around. And uh, those of you who um, are new, you know, we finish uh, today. Um, the second half and of uh, Benjamin's book is Vanessa was saying in her intro. Uh, and, um, you know, want to welcome you to uh, Literally Literary. Or maybe we can call it Lit Lit just for short. It's a little easier to say. Um Either way, it's going to be lit. Yeah. Um, and uh, so today we actually have most of the poems, I think. Um, so hope you all are doing well. You guys doing good? Yeah, doing good. Yeah. Yeah, no no hostage situation. Uh, this time. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, that time of year where um, things get pretty crazy in the semester. Um but let's let's talk poetry. So, uh, page twenty eight is um, the Great Glass Closet, and uh, it's a, one of the longer poems. It might actually be the longest one, um, at about four pages. Um, it's got sections to it. I think it's also. I mean, I guess you could call them sections, right? Those sushiras that yeah. divide the work. Um, it's, it's, a, um, it's simply one of the, the complex poems, you know, it's got a lot of illusions to me. I, I, I'm a big comic book guy. So, um, you know, reminded me a little bit of Jose when he has that poem to about Wolverine. Yeah. Here it's about storm. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, one of my, one of my written notes on this is, uh, Jose Olivares. Yeah. Cause it, you know, it, it did remind me of the Wolverine poem when he talks about mm-hmm. wanting to be storm. Mm-hmm. Um, but you said it, it is, it's dense, um, not only in illusions, but what we were talking about the previous episode uh, in terms of uh, linguistic fluidity. I don't know if I use that phrase, mm-hmm. but that's what I'm going to use this time. Yeah. I don't think you did. <laughs> so what do you mean by that? So uh, even though I didn't use a term, right. We, we did talk about that, how he kind of jumps around, from idea to idea as images to interrogate language and ideas. <clears throat> so for example, uh, well, I mean, a, a lot of the poems in this book interrogate language mm-hmm. and, and the ideas behind them, the meanings behind them, how we use them. Uh, and just, you know, you're reading this, there's again, a lot of playfulness with it, like, like of, of meanings and just uh, both semantically, but also visually. Um, so he talks about kind of like the meat, uh, you know, he does this in, in some other poems too, where he talks about um, the way a word is spelled and kind of rearranging letters. So for example, on uh, page 29, the second stanza, you know, for example, he talks, you know, continuing his, his illusion to Harry Potter, uh, you know, and that's, that's a series I grew up reading. So I'm like, yeah, so there's X-Men, <laughs> Harry Potter, like we can all identify with that uh, in some way. But uh, talking about owl, he's talking about Ed Hedwig, you know, and how they use owls to as their mail service. He says, I had no owl, no hat, no wand. I couldn't cast a spell and I couldn't spell, but I could see the low in owl. I could pull the hat. I mean, yeah, I could pull the hat out of that. And in the word wand, find another hidden end. So Kenny's talking about like the acquisition of knowledge, mm-hmm. recognizing mm-hmm. patterns in the words. And I think it's interesting how they they can take on another another thing another language another concept and he does this uh all the time and so when he's talking about x-men and storm mm-hmm. um and there's just so many great lines too like i survived too many storms behind the closet door that's just a great line mm-hmm. uh but he's you know he's talking about storm uh capitalized right mm-hmm. and i could never change my name to storm which at its core contains an or as in either or as in ororo Monroe, Storm's birth name. So I like how in, in Or from Storm, he also gets her name, Ororo, mm-hmm. right? Which uh, hard, only hardcore fans know, <laughs> right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, that is her name. 
Um, and then I just, again, fl- jumping from that, and you know, I, I talk about a lot of jumping around from images. And so he goes to, you must choose pink or blue, boy or girl, left or right, right or wrong, truth or lie, truth or dare, truth. You know, he kind of like, it, he weaves this, this uh, uh, um, ethereal thread, you know, and I just, it's, it's so fun to chase. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd love to talk more about lines, but I, I'm curious on, on your guys' thoughts because I'm kind of going a little long now. No, that's, I think, very well said. And I'm the one who asked what you meant by linguistic fluidity, which makes a lot of sense there. It's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Vanessa, what did you think? Uh, any strong lines from? Um, well, my, my strong line was the first line in the poem. This is not a metaphor. When I say that I lived in the closet, it's because I lived in the closet. So like this kind of play on words that Richie's talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, So we obviously know like he was kind of forced by his family to kind of hide that side of himself. Mm -hmm. But also because he had such a big family and they had such a small living space, he ended up having to also live in the closet. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like you're saying, you know, um, that that big family in a one bedroom, right? And um, I like how the dog is is um, there in the list. It's the last uh, living thing there. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and then there's me, the surplus, right? So even the dog is ahead of him. Um, and uh, yeah, like you know, like you're saying, um, I think um, this is a poem about. Um, reading between the lines and um, seeing that the shades of gray right um, at its core. And um, I feel that there's a romantic poet that kind of talked about that. Um, what's it called? Uh, what's his name? The, uh, Percy Shelley. Um, forget what he called that concept of like living in, in two worlds, you know, um, but he, it reminds me of that. Um, and, um, the, I, I always dig, uh, um, th- those kinds of poems that do interrogate the, the meaning of words and, you know, because those of us who do teach English, I think we always examine how those words are being used differently. Um, and, um, also I, I think like you're saying for the speaker, it does kind of show their, their curiosity, right. About how we play with words, you know, it harkens back to, um, the, 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 the whole poem, right. The whole collection, I mean, about language and the, the, the language question, right. As, um, interrogated here. To, to add, uh, with this piece, I don't know if you had any more to mention on, on this poem. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so just I just want to point out things I really enjoyed about it you know um, t- continuing with with not only just thinking about language and words and meanings mm-hmm. the way he links uh, these sections together so um, you know let me see where, where I can start this because you know in that section where he's talking about Harry Potter and Storm and then the following that Cesaro he goes into this uh <laughs> And I, again, you know, I love he, how he goes from sometimes there's no difference between the past and present. Cool line. But then he, he kind of adds to it by looking at the way we, we look at a word that is spelled the same, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it means different things or just different tenses mm-hmm. to read and to have read, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and uh, from there, he kind of goes on to just talk about context which i think is an interesting concept that he presents here um you know he talks about how seeing people on tv that weren't like him not in the closet right Mm -hmm. so i lived in the closet because they weren't like him but then that the next section is interesting he goes to uh i guess it's a tv show Mm -hmm. i haven't really heard of it yeah Um, i wanted to, to look that up i uh by the way yeah if you are students listening Right now, uh, when you read, you know, definitely, I mean, I'm sure you guys already do this or, or your instructors have told you, but man, take good reading notes. And, and sometimes a good reading note is just if there's something you don't know, just make a list and you can you can look it up. 
I think it will definitely enhance the reading and it might give you a deeper meaning to, to what you're reading most of the time. So, and with that said, I didn't, I did not have the chance to look it up, but obviously what he's talking about here though, is this very, very interesting moment where um, they recognize someone like them on TV. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I love that. I really love that quote there. Um, like a traveler from a foreign country who runs into someone from home, someone they've never spoken to, but they know by sight. I recognize her with a surge of joy. So I imagine uh, for a lot of people who identify as queer, right, and they're refer referring to like a woman wearing men's clothes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, men's haircut. So I imagine to kind of see that represented on, on TV, um, that surge of joy is, is a very important moment. And I think it's also an interesting way to link um, spoiler alert, Allison and her father were both in the closet, but they were not in the closet together. Very interesting line. And of course he, he takes this to move onward to talk about more of his family, what the closet means to breathing from breathing to Dr. Doolittle and this, this idea of the snail. So we get back to aquatic animals in the previous episode. We, we kept, we kept running into them, right. That he uses. And so mm -hmm. the great glass sea snail becomes this metaphor as a closet, right. That, but uh, whereas he was living in a, in a room with no windows, all walls, the snail is of course, all windows, no walls. Um, and the way he ties it into in interesting at the end, his last line, the immigrant experience, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of one of my strong lines of the entire book. Mm. Uh, when I climbed in, when the great glass sea snail borrowed its, bowed its great neck to me and let me enter, hoping I had enough air heading straight for whatever waited on the next shore, like any immigrant would. It's kind of that, that uncertainty mm -hmm. of taking that leap, not knowing where, where you're going to end up, but you know, that's for the promise of something more. Yeah. I, I really like that line too. And how it's split up with that from that last stanza, right? It's on, it's on its own and it's almost centered. Um, and yeah, that fun home. So apparently it's, um, it's a musical and it's the first musical from Broadway that has a lesbian uh, protagonist. So mm. yeah, definitely got to check that out. Um, Sweet. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Oops. A toast to the, to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, I had some lines from this one. I don't know about you all. Um, so, you know, right off the bat, the, the title does pre pre present um, incongruent images, right? Like a toast, you think it's celebratory and it, you know, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, which of course, you know, um, many branches of Christianity kind of associate with like, um, you know, um, the, the views of, of, um, a homophobia, right. That, but, you know, others identify that more as, um, related more to hospitality, um, from other, from another different reading of it from, um, from that in, in Genesis, um, and, um, you know, we, we have the father come back here in this one. And it, uh, my lines um, were there at the bottom of, of uh, 32. Um, my father looks at me like God look, looking for the smallest redemption in Gomorrah, looking for any reason in Sodom not to raise it. There is no reason for how things are sometimes better to accept. My father didn't raise me to be a girly man. A fact that might bother him, except for the other fact he didn't raise me. It bothers him. Um, I really love the um, turns of phrases, you know, the syntax. Um, mm -hmm. It reminds me, I don't know if you, if you all checked out, you know, Jose Hernandez Diaz. Um, he's got that collection, um, believe, I believe it's called The Fire Eater, I want to say. Um, sorry if I, if I get it wrong, I need to name, but super you know even if you just check out his work he he he's one of the most prolific authors like i i see him tweet and like it, it seems like he could publish every day so it's just amazing and the, the he, he his thing is prose poems is my point and um so i like the the prose in this one because it every new sentence kind of presents that new way of looking at it you know and he's done that before 
when it comes to his father, when if you remember the conversation with my father, you know, um, so I, I really like that that set of lines because of that. Yeah, I actually had the exact same thing. And I, I like how I pointed out or even in my more marginal notes, I wrote that um, I like how you can embed and embed a whole other story through a line, mm. you know, and that that fact. Right. Mm -hmm. Except for the fact, the other fact. He didn't raise me. It bothers mm -hmm. him. Like mm -hmm. that's, you know, I think sometimes a, a good, a good line in prose or poetry kind of makes you want more, more of that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and of course, just again with, um, <clears throat> I want to say the playful, the playfulness of it all. Right. Uh, with Sodom and Gomorrah, right. They, you, in the, in the tale, right. Often people relay that, that the cities turn into pillars of salt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like the ending of, of this piece, 33. Mm. Um, I drink beer because I'm thirsty, eating salted pretzels. I don't have a prayer when I say amen. It's uh, kind of like that that salty <laughs> pretzel. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that's a good catch. I actually hadn't thought about that, but yeah. That's his toast, right, drinking the beer. Yeah. Of course, it's all centered around to uh, his, his uh, brother's ride and mm -hmm. this whole thing of kind of objectifying their waiter, their server. You know, mm -hmm. you talked about a uh, host and I thought that was an interesting connection when you brought it up right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you had the next one, right, Vanessa? Yeah. Um, I Well, I just really like the wordplay in this one. Mm -hmm. So, oh, to the pitcher plant, right? Yes. Yeah. On page 34. Um, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you can just start at the beginning. Yeah, I was yeah. I was gonna say the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> How about the beginning or the end? No, from the line. back. From the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so right, it's one of the first things I noticed was the reference to Heather's. Um, I thought it was interesting how after Veronica Sawyer, it says, "But you'll have to die," because they mm. blew up the school. What is that a reference? Yeah, to? what what is that? Heather's. Oh, it's a movie. Move. It's from the eighties. Huh. Um. Hmm, how do you? Just... Comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Where they blew up the school. They blew up the school. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Wow, I can't believe you guys haven't seen that one. No, <laughs> no I got it was reference. I was just um, digging for oh. for. Uh... <laughs> no, no, I yeah, I never heard of it. Huh. I think it's on Hulu. Yeah. I think so. Hmm. You hear that, Hulu? You're sponsoring <laughs> us now. <laughs> Cha ching. <laughs> um, and then right after that, there's a reference to Romeo and Juliet. And then further down, there's, I like the wordplay there. So it says, um, my siren waters, semen, which is what a man's come is called. I want a man that comes when called. I want to have a better name for when women climax. So I just, so like the different ways that he like mm -hmm. jumps from topic. Hell yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like that. <clears throat> right. Gender fluids and fluid genders. Like it's mm, again, yes. it's, uh, yeah. I think and he's... then right after that, when he, um, the different meanings of come. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. not even like a, it's not even linguistic, uh, fluidity is like linguistic malleability mm -hmm. being being bent a certain way and and uh, again the syntax you mentioned Jorge. Mm -hmm. um the picture plant and of course we we had talked about like language before um so in, in cultures you know pitcher and catcher have certain mm -hmm. meanings as well right yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think uh rhetorically you know um there's that kind of you know, uh, seesaw in language where the word takes you this direction and then, you know, you get to the other Sushura and it takes you a whole different direction. Um, mm. And uh, I think in some cases it's almost like a, like that chiasmus, you know, where mm. there's that the inversion of the subject and the predicate too. Um, yeah, I, I just really love the odes in this collection as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> good examples. I, I really like that that line in here. Love 
In Spanish, those four letters mean come eat, they fold into each other. Lovely. Mm. Got a man, yeah, a couple more illusions. Yeah. Mm, Wizard of Oz. Narcissus. Narcissus for sure. Um I don't know, Victor with a capital V. Is that is that from the same Mm-mm. No. Um well I like how, you know, thank you for your participation. Yeah. Here. It is a reference to <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um I like the like you're saying, Vanessa, that the play with language in this one, um mm-hmm. in that thirty four at the bottom, come narcissist, come to your sissy prissy boy pussy pitcher, right? It's it's almost that tongue twister to it. Um mm-hmm. because of that flow of your tongue, you know, where you just kind of roll with it, right? Almost literally. Um mm-hmm. yeah. And like you're saying, you you had said Richie the first time, you know, I I think, you know, just for those of us who, because we're teaching, we're reviewing a living poet, you know, you can just YouTube him, right? YouTube uh, Benjamin mm-hmm. and, you know, check out his stuff there. Mm-hmm. Um, next up, we have um, a pairing. And it's one of the things I mentioned to y'all pre-show, or at least I told Richie that, you know, I think um, teaching p- poems in pairs always works really well for students to compare and contrast mm-hmm. and um, we have mutual monogamy and a non-monogamy. And um, so those are obviously, you know, different concepts. This desk is mahogany. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and Vanessa, you said you had non-monogamy? Yeah. Um, I had mutual monogamy. Mm. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so not either or, right? So... <laughs> Mutually mon- monogamous, only us, one plus one. It's, cut- it's considered a closed system. No one can get, can get in or out. And when no one can get in or out, we, should, we call that a jail cell. It's true. This method can prevent disease because you can't give each other something you don't have. But a relationship is like trying to put two halves of an orange back together. You have to keep holding them there or else they fall apart. Um, and it kind of just goes on. And, um, you know, this one does go into the, you know, HIV as is referenced there and it's referenced again at the end. Um, and of course it's, it's not just necessarily with, um, queer relationships, right. But also, um, with a uh, straight or other kinds of relationships. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I like, um, you know, that, that how it's described as a, as a closed system and, the metaphor of, um, you know, the, the orange, uh, that is split in half. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, with that imagery in there, I, I like, how it continues with the idea of the black hole. You can't cut it in half. It only, it only gets deeper. Mm. He makes that reference, but even at the beginning, mm. uh, he does something that we, we don't do. We haven't seen a whole lot of, but something the language poets do. Right. But he kind of starts creating like these, uh, he's referring to, marriage right You're talking about a closed system it's like when you say i do and and, mm. and so i think that's that's pretty interesting because <clears throat> you know a tuxedoed mister launching the arrow of his r between her m and s which i think is pretty clever right because he's talking about how one comes from a miss to a missus mm. in their in their honor honorific Mm-hmm. Uh, through marriage, which I think just it's it's a cultural thing, which he's referencing to here, but mm-hmm. uh, kind of makes it more sexual, but also kind of like a boring sexual. The way I mean, it feels like he's describing it as kind of like a, a boring kind of thing, right? Because he says, um, which uh, at the very beginning line, which implies a reciprocal relationship. The way six is to nine, huh? Get it, guys? Sixty nine. <laughs> but then he goes, although it usually means a missionary. <laughs> Right. And, and so he kind of goes into that, like you said, the institution of marriage, and he's kind of mm. talking about it more like of a of a, a trap. A trap? No, just like a jail cell. He uses those lines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, yeah, mutual monogamy. Yeah. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> kind of an interesting inversion, right? Yeah. Um, well, you, uh, for non-monogamy, right? Um it's kind of, you know, because when I first read Mutual Monogamy, of course, but and then I was thinking, well, non-monogamy, it's probably going to, you know, do something similar, right? But it's like totally different. 
So mm. what, what stuck out to you from that one, Vanessa? Honestly, the whole thing, I feel like it goes all to like, you can't just, I mean, you can, obviously you can take it apart, but like all of it together <laughs> is just so good. Mm-hmm. Um, just so we usually focus on the meaning of names and I feel like this one's similar, but it's just language as a whole, like the meaning of words. Um, I don't even know where to go from there. <laughs> there's so much. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there's a reference to Romeo and Juliet again here. Um, so it says, even if a rose did smell as sweet by any other name, I'm willing to bet shitball snot flower would garner few fewer gardens. Um, so like the importance of like words and names and their meanings. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I didn't pick up the, the Romeo reference. There. I'm a little rusty on it, but yeah. Mm-hmm. By any other name? By any other name? Yeah. 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 Wrote Shakespeare in the margins. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make it clear. <laughs> <clears throat> and then, well, it ends by getting more specific. Meanings under meanings are called subtext and words under words are called lies. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it's almost like um, this is to me the, a backstage poem in the sense that he's the speaker is offering us a window, right? Putting that green curtain and showing us like the knobs of how their writing process is working here. At least how, that's how I read it, right? Because the speaker is explaining, you know, what they are doing with, with the other poems, right? So mm-hmm. it's got this metatextual element to mm. it. Yeah. Um, and uh I also like that, you know, we had Sodom and Gomorrah, mm-hmm. so we had like biblical illusion, and here we get the word no, which biblically, you know, does mean that, right, to have se- uh, sexual relations with someone. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so there's that element to it as well, that it's not just metatextual, but it's also intertextual, mm-hmm. um, and it's subtle in in this mm-hmm. case. Right, yeah, pre-show, I I believe I was mentioning how after some of these poems, uh, once he interrogates a word or takes it apart or rearranges it, you know, its next instance, I don't read it the same way. You know, mm-hmm. I, I kind of question it in the same way. Like, oh, is he using it? How is he using it here based mm. on what I know already? Yeah. You know, so he does that with no. <clears throat> I think it's interesting. And, um, and again, it's very kind of like that, that postmodern playfulness of, of like even just talking mm-hmm. about the word no. You, mm-hmm. you can deny it. N O sits in the middle, and who knows what the K and W are doing? Jiggle a little, jiggle a letter here, and slide a letter there, and get rid of what is silent. You get the word own, which I think is an interesting concept when talking about relationships, sexual relationships mm-hmm. of uh, non-monogamy um, or monogamy. Right? Mm-hmm. I think oftentimes uh, what people experience in, in you know, once you get to that that point of relationship owner like ownership kind of becomes a, a very interesting thing mm-hmm. of like mm-hmm. why i think a lot of people want non-monogamous relationships for maybe that reason mm-hmm. to not feel um like they belong to someone mm-hmm. mm. yeah and it's kind of represented by that question right that the speaker poses at the end i might sleep with 1200 men but who could know me more than you um so given also not just that the word no right but it's got that multiple that pun to it mm-hmm. um the subtext that is just referencing the previous line mm. yeah yeah it's one, one little stanza but it's all there yep. <laughs> yeah. here we go <laughs> you want to take the lead on this one richie i know you were talking about this one pre-show <clears throat> well <clears throat> Um, you know, I'm trying to be brief, but I know that uh, maybe a lot of people might enjoy the bliss point or what can best be achieved by cheese. Um, it's 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 a fun poem to read through, and and again, another another fun one to read out loud. Um, it's a, it's you know, it's just kind of interesting. I, I think uh, this one kind of also reminds me of uh, another of Jose Olivares and Citizen Legal when he's talking about kind of like the food, the junk food, mm-hmm. uh, plastic, you know, what's real, what's not real. Mm-hmm. He's here he's talking about a, a Cheeto puff. And uh, I think, you know, what an intro. It's 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 not an ode, but it's kind of like an ode here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 
uh, the way it goes from Bliss Point. What can be best achieved by cheese, a.k.a. the other gold. Now that's the stuff. Shredded or melted or powdered or canned. Behold, the pinnacle of man in a Cheeto puff. Now that's the stuff. You know, and then he goes on and wax and wanes like... Uh, it's very fun to perform and read out loud. Mm-hmm. Goes from mm-hmm. puff to puff, and and again the 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 layout right kind of zigs you along. It's a, z- it's a literal zigzag on the page, mm-hmm. going from left to right, left to right. It's it's, it's nonstop. And, he, and and again that line that reminded me of of Jose's where he was it page thirty nine. Kind of questions, of course. The it's obviously it's a Cheeto. It's not like the most healthy thing, right? Um, and of course, he mentions anteater again. Look, we got another anteater appearance <laughs> on thirty nine. And you are not an anteater. Anteater. An anteater eats ants without fear of diabetes, though breathing one could say resembles a chronic disease. What? What's real cheese? And what is cheese product? It's difficult to say, but being alive today is real. And it goes on. And I think it's a nice kind of break from from the content before, mm. kind of moving onward in, in the collection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it's still got that playfulness, so right? I, I mean, there's um, these poems do have that, I think, um, in different places. But this one does have it kind of all around, right? Um, and like you said, I, I um, you know, harkens back to that uh, Otto Cheese Fries from Jose Olivares. Um, and... Um, it's 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 really strong in its imagery, I think, more than anything. This one, you know, the the puffy and, and um, how it takes that from, you know, the chain smoker and all that. Um, and um, of course, you know, I always like um, um, literary um, metaphors. You know, so we get this one at the end. Um, it's difficult to say, but being alive today is real, real, really like a book you can't put down. A stone that plummets from a great height. Life's a page turner, all right. And then it ends with, you know, and I'll binge on this, the final season with you. So it kind of takes it, you know, from the literary to the, you know, the, 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 the going back to the couch, right? With the Cheeto puffs and all that. Yeah. I mean, mm. to kind of just really quick bounce off of that. Uh, you know, he's been referencing the animal kingdom all throughout this collection. And here he actually does make a, a reference to a, I think a pretty well-known anthropological text, uh, the human animal, because I think it's, it's such a specific phrasing, hmm. the human animal. And, and um, hmm. yeah, that was, that was written by Weston Lobar. And uh, it's kind of like a psychoanalytic look into, um, you know, culture you know, psychology. Hmm. Uh, but it is interesting how he, he kind of uses the reference to our evo- evolution. Mm-hmm. Actually, that's a presence I'm, I'm, we didn't really bring up, but he talks about evolution here. Um, long mm. ago, we beached ourselves, climbed up the trees, then down the trees, knuckled across the dirt and grasses and thorns and Berber carpet and carpet all the way to the evolution of here we are now on a couch binge watching TV shows <laughs> throwing cheese puffs into our mouths mm-hmm. I think it's an interesting mm-hmm. yeah. movement there yeah smug in your snuggie and snug in your sloth oh yeah I love that I love that yeah. wordplay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah man of war yeah antiode to the man of war um here we get, again, the explicit reference to the language, right? And so going back to the idea of language questions uh, and odes, of course, right? Another ode. Um, this one, you know, the the imagery uh, brings in more of like botany, right? So we get like poison and venom um, and, um, you know, it, it's it turns it into the you know, the, the playfulness, right. With relationships when it says, um, uh, another way to think of them as venoms are the tops. They're active and pushing while poisons are the bottoms, the tubers, the roots, the locks of hemlock haired book boys, the cads and the rent who owns, you know, how I know you're a poison. It's cause you're lazy, daisy and docile. Um, yeah, yeah. that, 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 um, that's it's such a very interesting connection, and but I do I do love how he draws from because I I've always actually been 
fascinated with the distinction between both words. And uh, he actually does talk about it in the fourth stanza of the poem. Mm. Uh, Venom and poison. It's all about who is doing what to whom. Bite me, and it's called a poison. Venom when I bite back. Mm. So he kind of takes that that logic to those lines you just read, I mm-hmm. think, which was pretty interesting. Yeah. Dudes, he knew. There's that new again. I wonder if Whitman might have meant dudes he knew. Husked and mm. filled his debonair. <clears throat> and then uh, he brings up the jellyfish again. And uh, this is where I, I was talking about. I, I, I feel he's referencing a, a Pablo Neruda poem at the end. Yeah. Because uh, between the last two stanzas. And the only reason I know is because it's like one of my favorite endings of a poem. Mm. I want to do with you what spring does to the cherry trees. Mm. And here you have uh, the end of the second stanza ends with, I want to do with you into the next. I want to do with you. Then he brings up in the spring and then blossoming. <laughs> so, because mm. in some translations, uh, some people have done cherry blossoms instead of cherry trees. Hmm. So I'm like, hey, that's kind of uh, echoing Neru a little bit. In this case, again, he's relating to a, a jellyfish, mm-hmm. which, you know, stings and has a bite. Right. And maybe it's just me seeing things I want to see. Who knows? No, I mean, um, you know, I mentioned that, yeah, I, I really do got to check out Neruda. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys are picking up all these illusions, you know, whether it's Neruda or that, what was that movie called? You said? Oh, Heathers. Heathers. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. Heathers. So all kinds of illusions in this one. Um, did any of you had a, um, Birds of Illegal Trade or uh, Silver City? I liked the riddle in Silver City. Could you read the line? Yeah. What can be divided like a worm, squirms, welcomes itself into one body, is alive three times. You would exchange a ton of gold for any measure of it if you only knew it was leaving. Give some time for the readers to think about that one. (laughs) Um, You threw me, oh yeah, I'm like... Where is it? Oh, it's the next poem, right? Silver City. Next poem. Yeah. <laughs> the real. Um, I bet you guessed water. You'd be right. But I wasn't thinking water. I thought God or the universe. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, the, the gold that you that you just read there, of course, we had just talked about gold, right, with cheese. So, again, going mm-hmm. back to that intertextuality. Um. And, you know, this poem also is referencing how, um, you know, they have this idea of zero scaping and, and how, you know, it's to preserve water. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis here on like the, the, the dump trucks that and um, so that kind of labor. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, in the next poem, we get self-portrait as a man-made diamond where, again, you know, something that's underground. And, of course... I can't remember which poem it was, right? But there was that other poem, right, that talked about the diamond. But um, this one is takes it a different direction. Um, but it does also begin with the epigraph because the other one was talking more about, um, I think it was blood diamonds, if I recall. Um, but this one, you know, um, takes it into the more commercial, right, the man-made diamond as it's described. Um the hope diamond it was yeah yeah um and um the epigraph you know your own very lifetime diamond can be created from the carbon and cremation ashes uh, a lock of hair just that whole idea right of like preserving someone that way um Mm. and uh you know, it, it kind of makes it a little bit morbid, but also makes it to where, like, you know, this is where society has gone, right, in terms of how we honor the dead, how we remember our mm-hmm. lost ones. Um, <clears throat> kind of going with uh, m- monogamy, right? He references, mm-hmm. you know, that, that whole practice of, of giving a, a diamond ring, right? To do the great, the great I do there, mm. cannonball into the infinity pool. 
I give my warm up, if I agree to live in the permafrost of forever, where nothing is able to leave a footprint or a sketch because there's nothing for me in or- immortality's tundra. It's a pretty uh, dramatic way of looking at marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like you're saying, right. And looking, pairing this one with non monogamy, right. Um, and, um, and that hope diamond one. Uh, did either of you had a heart conceit? <clears throat> I had the one after that. Um, yeah, I had lines, but uh, let's, we can continue because we're already at 40, like 45 minutes. Okay. Um, so, um, what I liked about gay uh, epiphtalimium is um, how it kind of brings up, um, you know, um, th- those kinds of microaggressions that. Um, mm. you know, people can have good intentions, right? But they can still come off as homophobic in this case. Um, and the uh, epiphtalium is a word I had to look up, but it's a song or poem celebrating a marriage, um, mm. which is interesting, you know. So basically, it, it's like an ode to that, you know. But here it begins with um, girls never ask your gay best friend when they're getting married. Never call your gay best friend your gay best friend. Boys and girls, never ask your gay friends who is the woman and who is the man. Because that's the whole point. We may act like a lady, but we don't care for the lady parts. Boys, if you mean to ask who is the bottom and who is the top, I hope you know that asking this demonstrates interest in being one of the two. Um, So yeah, I I really like that opening. Mm -hmm. You know, um, goes back to the it kind of takes us back to the more political element in this collection. Mm. Um, It is a very interesting uh, kind of discussion, like on how heteronormative people tend to think of, tend to want to still apply though heteronormative, like methods to obviously a homosexual relationship. Mm -hmm. When they ask like, who's the, who's the one, who's the girl, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. um, you know, even right now when we were watching the the Bully McGuire, I had forgotten about about that line uh, where I mean, you you see it all the time. We I, I grew up with it. Probably a lot of us grew up, but where like, um, being being gay or homosexual or queer was like a was supposed to be like a put down, right? When you know it's it's not. Mm-hmm. But you know, like I was thinking about the the Spider Man when he's when he's in the cage match with uh, Hulk. It was no, 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 no. An actual Spider Man, oh. first one, <laughs> Macho Man. I forgot, I forgot the character's huh. name. Uh, but he kind of is like, nice outfit. Did your husband make it for you? Yeah, you know, kind of like uh, mm. you know, and Spider Man's shtick has always kind of been like banter, trash talk, kind of. Like, yeah, not really trash talk, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm. it just kind of reminds me of as a callback to that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Um. And then, you know, going back to the word, the the meaning of words, right, which I think this, we established already the whole collection is about, there aren't enough words for being gay, fairy, pansy, sissy, and even cake, but also confirmed bachelor, friend of Dorothy, family. Why do you smash cake into your spouse's face on your wedding day? You don't have to answer because my tongue is in my cheek again, right? And I feel that really does capture the... The, the the whole collection's playfulness. Yeah, I underlined that. Yeah, actually, I double underlined it. <laughs> nice <laughs> to emphasize the, the point you were just making. Yeah, um, we la coche is um one of my favorites in the whole collection, um, and uh, it's something you know I've never had right. So it's like a, a kind of fungus you know they can put put on on tacos or other kinds of food. You know, but so it's an edible one. Um, but you know, um, it it starts again with like the the insults, right? You know, for for people who are identify as as who are queer or gay, right? And so you get the f word. You know, you get the, the words the word in Spanish, which starts with a J. I won't say it. Um, but then the speaker says, "Unhusk me if you must." Call me acquired, call me dirty, call me corn smut. And that's what we what La Coche translates to corn smut. Um and um so yeah, I, I like how this poem, you know, 
plays around with Huila Coche, you know, go, takes it apart, right? It's a corruption of the Nahual Huila Cochin, which is a corruption of Huila Cochi. Tongues make mistakes and mistakes make languages. I think that sums up, mm. you know, a lot of things yeah. here. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> I underlined a lot of lines in this mm-hmm. one. It's, uh, including that one. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have <laughs> like the whole point. Some, yeah, right. I mean, you know, you also have uh, words have their luggage, like immigrants have their customs. Um, and so it's interesting mm-hmm. in the idea of language making and culture, like like you said, that line you you just read and quoted. And uh, I also think it's interesting how um, he kind of uses a, a dialogue in here to make up some other points. <clears throat> and of course, an italics is, is someone ask you know someone else, but it sounds so be- uh, it sounds so hateful when you say it. Mm. A coworker really said this to me. I said, because that's the way I always heard it. How do you speak such good English anyway? Right? It's kind of again another of those mm. we always reference them. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> just even again as references as a wheat like coche, had to look it up mm-hmm. um, as a no unwanted part of corn. But yeah, people people eat it too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's yeah. And it was a terrible close. Sorry. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, don't edit that out. Um, <laughs> I won't. But as I, I see, you have a lot of lines underlined in this one. Um, well, one of the ones that I wanted to mention was um, on page fifty four, mm-hmm. where it says. Call me what I am, and if you can't pronounce my surname, I'm supposed to say, don't sweat it. I feel like that's a really important one. Like, learning how to pronounce people's names is, isn't, i don't think, a hard thing to ask. Right. Right. Um, and he repeats that, too, um, yeah. after the conversation that uh, I read out loud, which I think was the mm-hmm. point. I, I ended so terribly on that, right? right? Say, it goes back to that right, thing of, yeah. smile, say nothing, don't sweat it. He aimed it as a compliment. Right, like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. kind of things that yeah. you're told or you tell yourself. Of. Yeah, and um, it it does kind of combine that, you know, the the microaggressions against the the LGBTQ community with uh, microaggressions against immigrants, right? Like you were saying, Richie, mm-hmm. you know, where it says um, learning English, it hurt. It is what I would say when I wanted to say it hurt. Right, and I think you know we as English teachers, of course. You know, um, that that's that's the point, right? Of like the, you know, the, there's a school that's more progressive that doesn't see that necessarily as an error or as something that needs to be fixed, right? Right, and I think mm-hmm. that's kind of embodied also in, in the idea of the of the corn smell, right? Like you said, it's kind of unwanted. It's a fungus, right? It's something that is not natural to the to the thing, right? To the corn. Um, and then the corn itself, right? Very, of course, symbolic of the whole Aztec, you know, um, Mexica uh, people. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Forget me not. <clears throat> oh, to touch me not. Mm-hmm. I uh, did you guys have this anything underneath? Yeah, I had some lines. Okay. I uh, I don't know. I had I had to just really quick like. I think it's an interesting look on uh, on naming conventions and like there's a, like a colonial aspect to that, right? Hmm. Uh, of you know having to discover and name things like a flower. And so he's kind of like digging at at the guy who named the touch me not, and obviously he uses this as a window to talk about you know obviously other concepts and you know and, and on a sexual terms or like uh, in terms of consent. And uh, mm-hmm. I just think it's, I think, a really biting line towards toxic masculinity. Uh, what is it? On page 56, the third stanza from the bottom, he ends that with saying, this is a man's true fear to not be needed, which I <clears throat> see a lot of, uh, I, I think that does lead to a lot of toxic behaviors for men. And then also, uh, of course, just kind of the dig at the end. This this was a poem that really did make me laugh out loud at the end. Um, because he named it a forget me not, right? Mm-hmm. The the man he's like, who can remember his pathetic name now? Not me. Uh, clever again, again with the play, play the turn of phrase. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm curious about your guys' thoughts on this one. 
Yeah, yes. I mean, uh, it does take the, this this very, um, you know, uh, problematic notion of, um, you know, when 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 someone rapes, right, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, when you know it goes into like what what consent is, right, you know, and um, I think you know going, I, I think it just embodies the whole connection really well, and and how it's both playful in parts. But at other parts, um, it it does help you see the, um, you know how it's it's taking tackling like a serious issue, right? Uh, um, and uh, to me, you know, the the beginning was what stood out. Um, you know, I'll tender you, f- I'll tender for you an enthusiastic get bent. My body isn't up for debate, so you can go shave your palms now. Drop dead. Bitch, I might take a page from female dragonflies that fall on their backs, spread their legs, and wait for the man to go the fuck away. But with, with my luck, he'd be a necrophiliac. You know, he had talked about, uh, the speaker had talked about necrophilia uh, in another poem, right? Uh, I think it was one of those language in questions. Um, and I think as a whole, I, I really like how the the speaker and, and the speakers and, and the speaker in these poems takes those you know different animals right in this case the dragonfly in other cases you know the anteater uh etc uh octopus you know and then it just turns it into a whole other uh applies it right and, and then makes it into that metaphor uh that works really well you know and i think it's a lot of it is about this this kind of resistance and um you know, whether it's through microaggressions or in this case, literal resistance, right? Someone who's being a, a creep in the sexually assaulting um, the speaker. Hmm. I also noticed the reference to like Medusa. Hmm. But yeah. I think that's really interesting because, yeah, just thinking of like the way that she's represented in mythology as being like evil mm-hmm. when... She's only like really responding to the way that men have treated her, and she's only been cursed because she rejected their advances. Yeah, great, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like, um, like maybe there was another re- reference to Medusa in another poem, but I know there was a reference to Narcissus, right? But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I I really like all the illusions that that one's subtle, right? Yeah, that, uh, one, that one's a lot more subtle. Yeah. It says, they'll swing you by your head, by your hair, and call it snakes. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's awesome. Um, I I had the last poem, but I don't know if any of you had the... Um, so, the last old, I should say. But I don't mm-hmm. know if you, any of you had it, uh, other ones, uh, the language in question or home keeping home. Mm, I just wanted to touch on the language in question. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I felt like this one, the language in question I felt was mental health, mm. um, and like suicidal thoughts and mm. just not feeling like you're enough, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, um, one of my, my strong line was warning signs can go unnoticed until I didn't think they were that serious. Um, <clears throat> I feel like a lot of times when it comes to mental health, it's more like a gradual downfall rather than like you're just right there at rock bottom. Um, so it's interesting to see like these warning signs go unnoticed until it's too late. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then I also liked um, so towards the bottom of page 58, the garden thrived except the lilies planted in full sun didn't make it. Um so for me, I interpreted that as meaning um, the garden as a whole, as men- his mental health as a whole, mm-hmm. is doing really well, except for this one area that needs that kind of needs help. Mm. Yeah, and in the ending too, um, you know, mm-hmm. it kind of reminds me of like Concrete Rose, you know, and, and I, there's mm-hmm. other poems, of course, you know, you mentioned Richie that talked about blooming, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I planted a new tree in the hollow of what I had lost. One day I'll rest in its shade. Should I live that long? Mm. Um, and so again, that idea of, um, you know, starting anew and um, turning, you know, turning the page to, 
try to regain something. Um, and like you said, yeah, it is interesting that I think this is kind of the first one, right? That does kind of tackle that mental health head on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So that, that is the last language in question. Yes. Um, and then, you know, so we, we get the last ode as well. Um, unless one of you had keeping home, but you know, um, Oh, to Adam, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right here, but oh, to Adam Rippens, but right. And the name itself, right. You know, um, kind of like, of like someone, you know, rips their jeans or whatever. Right. Um, and it's almost like, like another language in question, right. Cause it begins in the language of the body. Um, and so I, I really like the, again, the, the playfulness in this one, the illusions, you know, a lot of the olds have this quality to them. Um, to me, it's just the, the last four stanzas. Um, that's the discourse of some guys think it doesn't matter that he's gay. It matters out in public at the doctor's office. It matters. It matters to the men who would beat him and he might get beaten in technique. Adam said as much, but no one turns a cheek like me smeared in vice president's P Pence's rhetorical smatter. Don't tell me it doesn't matter. Right. I, I really love that line. So this is an ode to Adam Rippens, but go ahead and call it shallow. The rink is so because it needs to be hell half frozen over. And I'm here making angels out of snow with a fury to jump high first crouched low. Uh, it's um, it's a wonderful ending to a collection and, and to the old to the last ode. Mm. Um, and, you know, it also takes that serious turn, right, that we see these poems take. Um, you know, you had mentioned Richie that Adam Rapone is um a gay uh figure skater and um not in the closet, right, as you mentioned. Um but um you know bringing up Pence, of course, you know, he's known as being uh homophobic. Um and um you know the, those encounters, right, of I think this poem paired with um glass the last the great glass closet would be really interesting and in, in comparing and contrasting and i like how you know it's got that like i said it's it's coy right you know adam ripon's but right you know i can imagine what this would be like reading it in a workshop like for an mfa you know um where like someone might say something right well is that something that it's worthy and been old, right? Kind of reminds me of, of Elizabeth Acevedo when she has that old to the um, pigeon or whatever it, it oh, is, right? What is rat. it? Rat. Rat? Old to the mm -hmm. rat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, yeah, I... Pigeon is a flying rat, you know? <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> um, <clears throat> did you all have any final thoughts? Great work. Great work, Benjamin. You know, uh, if you're listening, thank you. I really, I really appreciated the whole work. And <clears throat> it was unique to a lot of the other poetry collections that we've read so far. And, and yeah. uh, I do, I do really enjoy the, <clears throat> you know, well, yeah, the joy of, of reading and, and the way you took language to task mm -hmm. and of course your themes. So thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Literally Literary, brought to you by Border Senses and Power at the Pass. This episode, we discussed Thrown in the Throat by Benjamin Garcia. If you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Join us on our next episode as we begin discussing Guillotine by Eduardo C. Corral. Follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep and on Twitter at literallylitep.